Howdy, Pastor Mark Driscoll here. Really excited to help you learn God's Word here at Mark Driscoll Ministries. We like to help people learn God's Word and we like to help leaders teach God's Word. And we've got a lot of new resources for you, all free, through the great book of 1 John in a series titled, The Father Heart of God. John was Jesus' nearest and dearest, closest and most faithful, best friend, and as an elderly man, the last living disciple of Jesus, he writes this amazing letter, and in his words, we hear the Father heart of God. I had the opportunity to teach this book in 13 weeks as a Bible study for the core launch team of the Trinity Church that I'm having the honor of planting in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I wanted you to learn God's Word, and so we've also provided for you about a 20,000 word study guide. This will help you study it personally with your family and or a small group. And for those of you who really like to go deep, we've got a free 240,000 word research brief that was put together by a team of scholars and professors and we'll give it all to you for free at markdriscoll.org. Go ahead and sign up and any gift that you give will help us to give more Bible teaching away. Thanks for the help. Uh, Lord God, thank you that you are a God who is love and that from you flows true love and that Lord God, you love us and that you love through us so that we can love each other. And Lord, this, this tremendous theme of love as we open one of the most important sections in the whole Bible on this issue of love, please send the Holy Spirit to, to remind us of your love, to, to touch us with your love to give us of your love that we might love you back and love one another in Jesus' name, amen. So let me ask you a question. If I asked you for something you didn't have, I said, I need you to bring them, I don't know, a pony, a sherbet, um, leg warmers from the 80s, something you don't have, okay? If I was asking you to get something you don't have and give it to someone, what you would need to do is find out where you could obtain it so that then you could receive it and then you could share it. When it comes to the Bible, God gives us over and over and over these commands to, to love him. Well, where do you go to get that love? To love each other. Well, where do you go to get that love? To love strangers. Well, that's, that's odd. Where do you go to get that love? To love enemies. That's hard, amen? Love enemies? Those people? You know how I know it's hard to love those people? I'm one of those people. That's how I know it's hard, right? When it comes to God commanding us to love, it can sound like this horrific burden and duty, this, this weighty responsibility. And it, it seems overwhelming and impossible because how do I give something I don't have? Where do I go to obtain something that, that, that I don't innately possess? How am I gonna love them? How will I love him? How will I love stranger? How will I love enemy? Where, where do we go to get this love? And so, so before God tells us what to do, God tells us who he is. And what he's gonna tell us today is that he is love and that he is the source of love and that all love flows from him. So you think of this like a river. If, if you're downstream, everything is flowing from upstream. So upstream, when it comes to this issue of love is God and everything flows downstream. So the love that we receive, we receive from God. And as we live in that flow of God's grace and love and spirit, then we have the love of God to share with God and to share with others. And so where he begins is 1 John chapter four, uh, beginning in verse seven, that love flows from God. Love flows from God. Beloved, okay, that's wonderful. Isn't that a great place to start? Say yes. Oh, well done, yes. Beloved, here's what it means. You're loved. Before God tells you to love, he tells you you're loved. What this means is we don't love people so that God will love us. We love people with the love that God has for us. I want you to see that, that love begins with your beloved. Next time you see a parent that loves their kid holding their hand, giving them a kiss on the head, realize God's a father, he loves me like that. God's a father, he loves me like that. He's, he's a dad, I'm his kid, he loves me, I'm beloved. If you're a Christian and you're here, you're loved by God. And somebody say, but I've done some bad things. Your dad loves you. Well, I've not been totally obedient to my dad. Well, your, your dad's love will change you. 
well, there's some things that I've done that are in a rebellion against my dad. I know, and your dad forgives you, he loves you. You need to see that your relationship with God is not predicated on your performance, but predicated upon his character. He loves you, you get that? Hey, beloved, you are loved, let us love one another. He's talking to the church, he's talking to Christians. For love is from where? It's from God. Again, he says, I love you, now go love each other. You say, well, where do I get that love? Well, it comes from God. You gotta go get that love from God and then go give that love to others. And whoever loves has been born of God. That is, we're born again, spiritually born as children of God. The love of God starts to flow to us and in us and through us. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. That's one of the most famous verses in the whole Bible, one of the most misinterpreted, misunderstood verses of the whole Bible. But obviously this sets up the theme for the section this week, and that is love. And love is one of the great mega themes of the whole Bible. In this book, 1 John, he's going to speak of love about 40 times in just five chapters. So it's a repeated refrain. Furthermore, the man who writes this, his name is John, and and he is the one whom Jesus loved. So he was there on the earth during Jesus' life and ministry. He saw Jesus cast out demons and go water skiing without a boat and feed a stadium with the little boy's lunchable. And he was there for all of it, heard all the teaching. And it says of this man that he's the one whom Jesus loved. So he was beloved of Jesus. He was like best friend, kid brother to the Lord Jesus. So he experienced the most loving friendship and relationship of anyone who has lived in the history of the world. No one had a friendship with Jesus like John and no one has ever had a friendship that was quite like the relationship that John had with Jesus. He was the one who Jesus loved. He was Jesus' nearest and dearest best friend. So when he talks about love, he's ultimately talking about something that he experienced in his few years of life and ministry with his best friend, Lord God, King and Savior, Jesus Christ. And at this point, he's an elderly man. He's somewhere between 80 and 100 years of age. And he's looking back on his younger years with Jesus. And he's recounting the days and the ways in which Jesus loved him. And now he's instructing Christians to love one another as Jesus has loved him, as God has loved them. Now, let me say this, God is love, but God is not only love. This is one of God's attributes. When we speak of God, we speak of his attributes. That God is holy, that God is just, that God is righteous, that God is loving, that God is gracious, that God is um, merciful. And all of these are attributes of God. And this is one of God's attributes. And let me say this, this is very crucial for us here at the foundation of the Trinity Church. Be careful that you don't take one of God's attributes and elevate it above all of God's attributes. Okay? Because if you say that God is sovereign above everything else, then perhaps you start to even believe that God is the author of sin and evil and God is not good. God is not only sovereign, God is also good. And he's both equally, fully, continually, perfectly. When it says that God is love, that is absolutely entirely true, but don't neglect the fact that God is also holy. He's already told us that God is holy in 1 John chapter 1, verse 15, where he says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. He's talking about the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the goodness of God. So early on, he tells us that God is holy and here he tells us that God is love. Both are true, simultaneously, perfectly, continually true. And something happens that is unhealthy or unwise when we take one of God's attributes and we rise it above all of God's attributes or we have it be the only attribute of God. And sometimes what wrongly happens with this issue of God is love is all of a sudden, what what is really meant is that love becomes God. The Bible doesn't say that love is God. It says that God is love. And, And here's why this is an important distinction. People who essentially turn love into God, they have a definition of God that then they judge God by. Well, God can't send anybody to hell. God can't separate from people for all eternity because God is love. God God couldn't say that other religions are wrong and Jesus is the way, the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father but by him because God is love and God is love and God is love. And what they're saying is that love as they understand and define it is God and that's not true. 
that God is love. What that means is whoever God is, however God is, whatever God says, that's the definition of what is loving. We don't have a definition of love by which we judge God. We have God by which we judge all other definitions and examples of love by. And so when it says in 1 John 1.15 that God is light, he is holy. And here it says that God is love. Both things are true. In fact, the Bible lists the holiness of God as the attribute of God uh, more frequently than any other attribute. So the most common attribute of God in the Bible is the holiness of God. So God is holy, he is righteous, he is pure, he is good, he is without sin. And God is love and he loves us and he cares for us and he has affection for us and devotion for us. And both are simultaneously true. And that'll lead into my next point. But before we move to that place, let's talk a little bit about love. Everything that God does is loving. I had an argument with someone very nice not long ago. They said, how could a loving God send people to hell? I said, how could a loving God not? I said, what do you mean? I said, if everybody who hates God and hates God's people gets to live with God and his people forever, I don't find that very loving. In the same way, if you hate my children, they would not feel very love if I moved you into our home. Amen? You would say, well, I thought you were loving. I am loving, I love you and I love them. But if you won't love them, I'm not going to have you live with them because you're not safe for them. And my primary concern is for the well-being of my children. And if you would like to love them and be loving toward us, we would like to do life with you in a safe relationship. But if you are opposed to us and you do not have love for my family and you want to actually do harm or oppose or harass or critique my family, I do love my family and out of love for them, I need to have a relationship with you that is not intimate and close but in fact protects those that I'm firstly responsible for. True or false dads, that's, that's the way it is. Right? That's the way that it is. God is a father, heaven is a home. We are his family and everybody's welcome to turn from sin and trust in Jesus and join the family and love the father and love one another and be in God's household safe together forever. But if you say, I don't love the father and I don't love the family. In fact, I hate the father and I hate the family. Then out of love, God the father says, well, I need to protect my kids. You're welcome to become one of them. But if you don't love them or me, I need to protect them eternally from you. Make sense? Everything God does is love. Everything God does has love infused in it, driven by it, love for his glory, love for his people. God, everything that God says and does is, is loving. And here's what's wonderful. I love this. Love is from God. We are God's beloved. Um, God is love. You have a deep, innate, significant need to be loved. True or false? Absolutely true. Because we were made in the image and likeness of God and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian God of the Bible, there is love that flows between them. They love each other eternally and perfectly. And we're made in the image and likeness of God and we're made to be loved and we're made to love. And so one of the greatest longings in the human soul and one of the greatest pursuits of a human life is to be loved and to love. Without that, we, we start to have significant problems in our life. Now, what God's love does is it meets that deepest, greatest need. That need is met by God's love. God is love, God loves me, I'm God's beloved, he's a father, loves me like his kid. My, my need for love, my longing for love, my pursuit of love, my appetite for love is met by God's love, God's perfect love. What this allows you to do is then start to love other people because when, when we don't have that need to, to be loved and the love met, we stop loving people and we start using people. Can I explain this to you relationally? Let's say that I don't believe that God truly deeply loves me, that I'm his beloved, that he's like a dad and I'm like his son. And my need, my longing, my desire for love, to be loved is not met. And then I turn to my wife, Grace, who I love with all my heart and she's my nearest and dearest friend. And I decide this need to be loved, it has to be met by you. What have I just done to that relationship? I put God-like pressure on, on a human being. 
And I'm saying, you need to love me perfectly. You need to love me continually. You need to love me unconditionally. That need for the love that God alone has, you need to satisfy it. What happens then is we stop loving people and we start using people so that we get that need for love met by them. The result is that we eventually crush them under the weight of expectation because they would say, I don't have a perfect inexhaustible source of love. My love is, is not continual. There are times I'm not a very nice person. My, my love is not unconditional. There are times that in my own sin, with my own selfishness, my love for you will be diluted and confused. My, my love for you will not be perfect. I will fail you. I will disappoint you. I, I'm not God. I can't be God. My love for you is not perfect like God's love for you and continual like God's love for you. And, and what happens is that when we don't have this need for love met by God and we don't understand God's pure love for us, what we start doing is using people rather than loving people, using them, manipulating them, controlling them, pressuring them, pleasing them so that they will love us and that need for love will be met. This leads to all kinds of unhealthy relationships. This leads to horrible dating relationships. All single women, pay attention. I love you. Here's a little five minute dad riff that's free. If you don't know the love of God for you, you will find someone else, usually a boy, to say that he loves you and to love you. And in an effort to get him to continue to love you, you will say and do almost whatever he wants. The result is that you are using him and he is using you and neither of you is loving one another. And that leads to abuse, that leads to harm. And what that ultimately leads to is heartbreak. And then you say, how could this relationship turn so dark, so dangerous, so deadly? We loved each other. No, you didn't, you used each other. God is love. God is the definition of love. God is the example of love. God is the source of love. And when we receive love from God, that need for love is met. Now we can love people with the love that God has for us and not use people to be the source of love for us. Make sense? You, 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 the love of God changes your whole life and it frees you up in all your other relationships to then love God and to love people with the love that God has for you. That's why when they come to the Lord Jesus and they say, okay, summarize for us, great rabbi, the entirety of the Old Testament. He says, well, it really comes down to one command in two parts, love God and love people. And that's how it works. God is love, God loves you. And then you receive that love and then you love God back and you love God um, by loving others with the love that God has for you. Now, this being said, I wanna give you a brief, simple definition of what love is because we don't have a functional definition in our culture. People love pizza. I don't think that's what it's talking about, right? I mean, some people love their favorite football team. Some people love their car. Some people love their home. That's not the kind of love that it's talking about. Um, there are many things that could be said about love and we'll hit it again later in the book, but. I would say for starters, love is selfless and it's sacrificial. It's selfless and it's sacrificial. Selfless meaning your needs are considered, that your wants are considered, that your person is considered, that you don't just exist for me, I exist to serve you. This is the example we see with the Lord Jesus. He comes not to be served, but to serve. He comes not selfishly, but he comes sacrificially. And he comes in such a way that he is, he's not selfish, he's selfless. That's how Jesus comes. And we live in a day of self-esteem, self-love, um, self-promotion, self-protection. We live in a day that is absolutely self-consumed. And, and what love is, love is other consumed. Love is not self-ish, it's self-less. It considers the other. It accommodates the other. I gave, give you a simple example. Some years ago, I was talking to a pastor, really you know, gifted Bible teacher, nice guy. And I was talking to him and his wife and they were having an argument because they were going to a wedding, okay? And she really wanted him to go to the wedding with her, but he didn't really wanna to go to the wedding. And then he said, okay, I'll go to the wedding, but after the wedding, we're going to leave quickly because I'm not gonna stay around. She said, no, we need to go to the reception so that we can dance together. 
How many of you guys don't like dancing in public? Okay. Okay, it's a majority. So he's not alone in his feelings, amen? And she says, but I really love to dance with you. And she says, we've been to all these weddings all these years and we always leave right after the wedding and you don't stay and dance with me. What should he do? Dance with his wife. Dance with his wife. Because love is not selfish, it's selfless. He's thinking, I wanna go home and sit on the couch. She wants to dance at the wedding reception. Love says, I will dance at the wedding reception, not because I love dancing, but because I love this woman who wants to dance. It's selfless. It's, it's considering the other and also it is sacrificial. It is sacrificial, meaning it costs you something. You're going to give up time. You're gonna give up money. You're gonna give up energy. To have a real loving relationship with someone, it's going to be expensive. It's going to cost you. But we see this with the Lord Jesus and this is where he's going to transition that Jesus' love is selfless and that it's sacrificial. And so here's my question to you. Who do you make sacrifices for? Who do you consider? Who do you give to? Those are the people that you love. And anybody says, I love you, but they're a taker, not a giver. That's not someone who's truly loving. God loves us selflessly. God loves us sacrificially, which brings us to his next point, um, that love flows through Jesus' cross. This is where we see the selflessness and the sacrificial nature of God's love. First John 4, 9 and 10, in this is the love of God was made manifest among us. There are some things that are unseen and until we see them, we don't understand them. I can give you this word love and you can consider it and ponder it, but until you see it, it's hard to understand it. It's hard to receive it. It's hard to embrace it. And so what happens is God's love is manifest. It's unveiled, it's made known, it's visible, it's seen so that we can all look at it and say, ah, that's what love looks like. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent us to be the propitiation for our sins. We'll get into all of this, but here's the big idea. God loves first. God loves first. And this is at the bedrock of what we believe as a church all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2, our first parents sin, they run from God, God comes looking for them. They weren't loving God, but God was loving them. They weren't pursuing God, but God was pursuing them. The whole storyline of the Bible is that, that Jesus is the hero, right? That God loves us first, that God pursues us first, that, that God desires relationship with us far far prior to any desire we have for relationship with him. This is that God initiates and we respond, that God loves and we love him back. And you need to know this, this takes all the pressure off because religion is all about, do you love God? Do you pursue God? Do you desire God? First it is, God loves you, God pursues you, God desires a relationship with you. You respond to that, but he initiates, he pursues you and then you react to him. Do you get that? That's how God's love is made known. And so he talks about three things here. He's gonna talk about Jesus. He's gonna talk about love and the cross. And he's gonna put all three of those together. So he talks about Jesus as uh, his what son? His only son. I won't get into all of the theology here, but, but this means that Jesus is absolutely unique, one of a kind, there's nobody else like him. My boys are here. I love my boys. I got three boys, but they're not, they're not one of a kind, the only kind on the earth. They've got the same mom, the same dad, the same genetics, right? I've got three sons. God has only one son, that's Jesus. That Jesus is God become a man, that the father sends the son, that he assumes human flesh, that God becomes a man in the person of Jesus Christ. And there's a heavenly father and there's an earthly mother and, and there's a lot of mystery there. And we always need to leave a bucket of mystery, say, I don't understand, I believe that. I understand that, but there's questions I still have about that. There's a bit of a mystery here and I'll, I'll acknowledge that openly and publicly, but, but there's no one else in the same category as Jesus. Right? The rest of us, we all descend from Adam. We all have a sin nature. We're all sinners by nature and choice. We all had a beginning in time at our birth or our conception as the case is. Nonetheless, Jesus is in a totally different category. He's eternal without beginning or end. He's fully God, not just a human being. He's fully God, become fully man. He has a heavenly father, he has an earthly mother, and it's God entering into human history to love us by seeking us and saving us. 
And so nobody's in the same category as Jesus. And so, you know, what tends to happen sometimes in our world is we'll sort of get the Mount Rushmore of high moral figures. And so there's Gandhi and Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr. and Jesus, and they're all these sort of moral examples for us. That's not the way that it is. Jesus is in a category unto himself. He's not just a good man, he's the God man. There's no one like him. There never has, never will be anyone equal to him. Jesus is one of a kind, amen? Okay. So that's what he tells us about Jesus. Then he tells us about love. Um, What he says, um, that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What he's talking about here is the cross of Jesus. That we know that God loves us because he sent his son to die for us. This is the issue of substitution. That because God is holy and we are sinners, God has a problem with sinners and our sin, but in love, he has chosen to pay that penalty and price himself through sacrificing his only son. His only son to make his enemies into his family. That's what God does. And what happens here, sometimes people will say, Let's not talk about the holiness of God. Let's talk about the love of God. Let's not talk about the wrath of God. Let's talk about the love of God. What he says here is, you cannot understand the love of God apart from the wrath of God because those two intersect at the cross of Jesus. That's what he's saying with this word propitiation. That God is holy and he is loving and he hates sin and he loves sinners. And at the cross of Jesus, he substitutes himself, Jesus does in our place for our sins so that he dies paying the penalty for our sins. So the holiness of God is met and the love of God is given and Jesus literally takes our place. And so when someone comes along and says, don't tell me about the bloody death of Jesus and the wrath of God, tell me about the love of God. My answer is, I can't tell you about the love of God apart from the death of Jesus in your place for your sins to satisfy the wrath of God, because that's how God's love is made manifest. It goes from this hypothetical category to this historical reality. And there's Jesus dying for us. And God is saying with a spotlight on the death of his son, there's the love, there's the love. I loved you so much, I gave you my son. I love you so much, I forgave all your sin. I love you so much that I didn't give up my holiness or my love, but my son came and he reconciles people to me and he reconciles my holiness and my love on the cross in the place for your sins. Unbelievable that God would do this, amen? And and so when he's talking about Jesus and he's talking about the love of God, he ultimately talks about the cross of Christ. Okay, so there's a reason why the symbol of Christianity is the cross. There's a reason why starting with uh, the early church fathers all the way back to, I think it was Tertullian began making the sign of the cross. There's a reason why for thousands of years, Christians have looked at the cross as the symbol of our faith because it's the place that God's love was most manifest and made known on the earth. And so whenever God talks about his love, he oftentimes also talks about Jesus' cross. He does it here. He does it in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he he gave his only son, right? Romans 5, um, he says it this way. For God showed his love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God's love points to the cross. Here's what I wanna tell you. God can't love you anymore. God can't love you anymore. And no matter what you do, God won't love you any less. (laughs) That's amazing. Because you're his beloved. He's, He's loved you. He's come for you. He's died for you. He's forgiven you. He has adopted you. He has committed himself to you. His love has flowed to you through the cross of Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're living apart from the love of God. And if you wanna live in the flow of God's love, you need to turn from sin, trust in Jesus. And there really is no understanding of love apart from the cross. And like I said previously, this is where we see that God's love is selfish and it's sacrificial. And as a result, God's love comes to us and God's love does a work in us. And then God's love starts to flow through us so that we can love God and love others in a way that is selfless and sacrificial because that is the kind of love that God gives us through his son. And this transforms all of our relationships. And I'll tell you, this will change your marriage. This will change your parenting. This will change your work relationships. 
This will change your emotional health and well-being. This will change your relationship with God. This will transform every relationship in your whole life if you understand God's love first. He then continues talking about how God's love flows to us through Jesus, and then it flows through us by the Holy Spirit to other people. Um, Firstly, uh, to Christians in verse 411. He says that love flows through us to Christians by the Spirit. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his Spirit. So he's, he's got this concept. He's saying, God is love. God brings his love to earth through the cross of Jesus. God takes his love through the Holy Spirit and puts it in the Christian so that they can love one another with that love that flows down from God. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And so the mark of a Christian is not only do they love God, but they love one another. And he's gonna say this a lot, love one another. You need to know this, at the bedrock of the Trinity Church has to be a commitment that we'll love one another, amen? And it doesn't mean we'll always like one another because we're gonna get on one another's nerves. Welcome to a family. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree with one another, but it means even when we don't like one another or we don't agree with one another, we'll still love one another because God the Holy Spirit enables that. And the Holy Spirit is the source of God's love. So let me explain it in this way. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian God of the Bible, they live together perfectly eternally in what? Love, love. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, they love each other perfectly and eternally. Here's what you need to know. God didn't make you because he's lonely. All right. Some Islamic teachers will say that God made us because he was lonely. God's not lonely. The Trinitarian God of the Bible has a perfectly fine relationship that's a lot easier than the one he has with me. All right. God didn't make us because he needs us. God didn't make us because he was lonely. God has a perfect loving relationship in and of himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been in this perfect loving union and communion for all eternity. And what he does is he takes the love that he shares with the Father and the Son and he brings it to the believer. That's amazing. What this means is this is a supernatural love, not a natural love. A natural love is I love people who love me. That's easy. They have such good taste, why would I not? A supernatural love is, I love people I don't know. I love people I don't like. I love people I don't agree with. I love people who are my enemies because that's how God loves. It's a supernatural love, it's a miraculous love. And some of you have read the Bible and you've thought, how in the world can I love like that? That's impossible. God commands me to do the impossible. God doesn't just command us to love, he sends the Holy Spirit so that we can. And when we love, we love by the Spirit's power and we love with God's love. And all we're doing is we're taking the love that we've received and we're sharing it with someone else. Here's the good idea I want you to know. You don't have to be the source of love. You don't have to be the source of love. God is the source of love. And God's love comes to you and then God's love flows through you so that you can love others. So if at any point you're saying, I cannot love them, you can. You need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit for the supernatural grace to extend the love to them that God has extended to you in Christ. This keeps us from wrath and anger and violence and vengeance and division and self-righteousness and hurt dominating our life. It liberates us to live in the flow of God's love by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the most joyful, peaceful, satisfying, gratifying life. It's a life that flows in the love of God and it flows through the love of God so that others are loved and we leave them in God's hand for judgment and justice. Not only does love flow from God through Jesus to us, to one another, it also flows out to the world, to non-Christians, beginning in 1 John chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. That is true, the world, what he's talking about here is um, 
the culture that does not know and love the God of the Bible, does not submit to, is not subjected to the God of the Bible. We're talking about the fallen, corrupted cultures of the world that are living in open rebellion against God. There's the kingdom of God, and then there are the worldly cultures of the earth, and they are in conflict, and God rules there, and they don't want God to rule here, and there is in obedience to God, and here is in disobedience to God, and God's desire is that he would rule and reign over all cultures, and right now there is this great great cosmic paddle between that which is worldly and that which is godly. And Jesus comes to be the savior of the world, of, of the godless people and cultures they produce. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, okay, that's what we believe. God the father sent God the son to die on the cross for our sins after living a life without any sin, to rise from sin conquering, from death rather, to conquer enemies of Satan, sin, death, hell, and the wrath of God. Jesus is the son of God. He is one of a kind. He is the savior of the world. There is no salvation apart from him. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So the love flows back and forth. You hear this language of abiding, it's love flowing. God's love flows to you if you believe in Jesus. Your love for God flows back if you believe in Jesus. And Jesus is the mediator between us and the Father. And he is the means by which this love flows. So we have come to know and to believe that uh, the love that God has for us. Man, do you believe the love that God has for you? I wanna get all that performance of works and religion. I want that burden off of you. Before God tells you what to do, he tells you who you are. You're loved, so go love. Before you worry about loving, make sure you understand how loved you are. When you understand how loved you are, you'll be more loving. God is, he says it again, love. And whoever abides in love, abides in God. That, that love flows from God to you and back to God. By this, love is perfected with us. It runs its full course so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we are in this world. What he's talking about here is our witness. The distinguishing mark of the Christian is love. The fruit of the spirit begins with love. Jesus says that all the commandments can be summarized in this love. 40 times in five chapters, John will say, love. Love God, love Christians, love non-Christians. When he's talking about the world here, he's talking about how do we interact with people who don't know and love the God of the Bible? And the answer is, we love them. We, we love them selflessly and sacrificially because that's how Jesus conducted himself in this world. And he now sends us filled with the Holy Spirit to be his missionaries. And you need to know this here at the Trinity Church. We see ourselves as missionaries to the valley, missionaries. What happens with the missionary? They go into another culture. They know it's not their home. They know they're a stranger. And they know that they're there on behalf of the kingdom of God to introduce others to King Jesus, that his lordship would begin to rule and reign over all of their life and all of their culture, making this transformation through God's love. What sometimes happens with the church in the West is we don't understand that the primary culture we're in is worldly. It's filled with all kinds of sin and abuse and folly and racism and classism and sexism and all of the isms are the world's way of saying, you know, the love isn't flowing very freely or fairly here. Well, the answer is ultimately and only Jesus. That everybody and everything needs Jesus to be Lord, to rule and reign over it, to, to cause his love to, to rain down on it and flow through it so that people are transformed and that relationships are reconciled first to God and then to one another. And so our posture here is um, Scottsdale is our residence, but the kingdom of God is our home. And we are sent on divine mission and deployment here by God to bring his love and the message of his son to the whole valley. And ultimately we know that not everyone believes that or will receive that because that is the world. But we want to introduce them to Jesus and to our God who rules over a kingdom in hopes that they would know the love of God, that they would experience the love of God, that the love of God would transform them and cause them to become the children of God. And what he's talking about here is how do you behave in a world that doesn't like you? And you need to know this right now, if you go on social media and just say, I'm a Christian, I believe everything in the Bible and on any current controversial political or social issue, I'll just give you a verse, true or false, you will not get a lot of love. You will not get a lot of love. So what do you do in response? Love. 
love. And what he says is that that is our witness to the world. Those people should be angry, they're very loving. Those people should be seeking vengeance, they're very loving. Those people should be just taking care of themselves and they're taking care of others, they love. Why do they love? Because they are loved. Well, who loves them? God does. And then the conversation turns from the issues and the conflicts to the love of God. And that's ultimately where every conversation needs to go. Love is who God, uh, rather God is love. God's love flows to us through Jesus. He sends the Holy Spirit to place it in us so that we can love one another. And he sends us out into the world as missionaries to love people with the love of God. And then ultimately the love of God, it flows back to God. He, he talks about God's love being made complete. What he's talking about is God's love running the full circle that love comes from God, that love flows through the cross of Jesus, that love is deposited in us by the Holy Spirit so that we can love one another, we can love this world, and then the love goes back to God. There is no fear in love, he says, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with what? Punishment. What are you scared of? What are you scared of? We're all all fearful of something. Fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because, again, he says it, he first loved us. You know why the Bible repeats things is because sometimes we forget them. Boy, when you're afraid of something, you quickly forget the love of God. So he repeats it. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a a liar. What he's saying is God's love doesn't just flow to you, it flows through you. God's love is not to be dammed up at your life, it's to be a river that flows freely downstream to those that are in relationship with you. For he who does not, uh, he says, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have heard from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. He's quoting Jesus who says that the whole Bible is about loving God and, and loving neighbor. There's two ways to live your life. Here's what he's saying. He's gonna bottom line it, lands the dismount. Fear or love? True or false, the whole world, the culture we live in, the entire political climate right now, it's really driven by fear. I'm not gonna get into issues, politicians or candidates. There is just a mood, if I could go so far as to say it, a spirit of fear. A spirit of fear. People don't feel safe. People don't feel loved. People don't feel cared for. Fear is the dominant emotional experience, I believe, that would define our culture today. What he's saying is there's two ways to live your life, fear or love. And what he says is this, fear has to do with punishment. Someone's gonna hurt me, someone's gonna take from me, someone's gonna harm me, this is is going to bring something that I don't want to happen, I'm afraid of that. And what he says is when you feel that, that fear, he says, leads to hate. You're not gonna hurt me. You're not gonna take from me. I'm not gonna trust you. I'm not gonna entrust myself to you. I'm fearful that something's gonna happen to me. And as a result, I hate you. And this leads to escalating conflict. And I would say, this is the mood of the day. Fearful people hating each other. Amen? I don't care where you're at on the political spectrum. You just pull back and say, I don't see a lot of love going back and forth. I don't see a lot of hope or joy or peace flowing. I see a lot of fear and a lot of hate, and I see a lot of conflict and not a lot of love. Because fear has to do with punishment. What are you afraid of? You're gonna lose your job, you're gonna lose your health, you're gonna lose your spouse, you're gonna lose your kids, you're gonna lose your parents. What are you afraid of? That someone or something is gonna take from you, is going to harm you? You know what? Relationships that are based on fear are abusive by nature. Let's say you're in a marriage relationship, a dating relationship, a parenting relationship, and you're afraid of someone. They're going to verbally assault me. They're gonna physically harm me. They're gonna financially destroy me. They're not safe. They're dangerous. I am afraid of them. 
That's by nature an abusive relationship. That's by nature a domineering, controlling, fear-filled relationship. And our relationship with those people, it can be in business, it could be in marriage, it could be in what is supposed to be a friendship, is all about how do I appease them and keep them from harming me because I'm afraid of them. Our relationship with God is predicated on love, not fear. Some of you don't know this. You don't know this. You try to do the right thing because you're afraid of God. You're afraid he's gonna send you to hell. Let me say, if you don't know Jesus, you are going to hell and you should be afraid of that. Okay, so let me just be honest. But if you belong to Jesus, your relationship with the Lord is no longer dominated by fear of punishment, but it's, it's driven by love. I'll, I'll tell you this about me. I met the Lord Jesus at the age of 19. There has never been a moment since that I have ever even pondered the possibility of going to hell. Never crosses my mind. That's all taken care of. Jesus died on the cross for all my sins, even the sins I haven't gotten to yet, but I'll get to, I'm trying, right? That's kidding. Um, I live in the love of God. I don't live in fear of God. You ever seen an abusive dad with a kid? You could tell, pretty intuitive, I grew up in a violent neighborhood. You could tell a lot when a father reaches out their hand toward the kid. What happens if the kid flinches? What does that indicate? Fear, that's not a safe relationship. They feel in danger. Father reaches out a hand and the kid leans into it. What does that tell you? Safe, they were loved, welcomed. Your relationship with God is not one of fear, it's one of love. One of the great joys of my life, if I put my hand out, my kids put their face in my hand because they know they're gonna get a kiss on the head because I'm their dad and I love them. And I hope they feel safe with me. And I hope they don't say, I gotta obey dad because if not, hell, fire and fury is gonna rain down on me. Fear does not motivate someone like love does. Love will cause people to do things that they would never do out of fear. True or false, parents and grandparents, out of love for your kids and your grandkids, you'll do things that nothing else could compel you to do. Out of love. It is so important for me that you understand the heart of God, particularly at this young, new church plant in this quirky old, weird Brady Bunch building with the Smurftastic dome, that, that you understand that God is holy and God is righteous and God is just and hell is real and God's wrath is eternal. And if you belong to Jesus, it's just love for you. It's only love for you. It's always love for you. And it's the Father's love for you. The result is you will receive that love and you'll take a deep breath and the burden will be lifted. Oh, I'm loved. I could check that off the list. And God doesn't use a pencil. He's not gonna erase it tomorrow and change his mind. I'm loved. Thank you, Lord. And now I can love the Lord. <laughs> That's great. If, I, if the Lord loves me and I get to love him, that's great. And he brings along people and I get to love them. That's great. And then we get to go out in the world and even if people aren't being very nice, it's like, well, I get to love them too and maybe they'll come to know him because you know what? Those are broken, hurting people that have never experienced his love and until they experience his love, they will not be changed. And if they're angry and they're violent and they're destructive and they're mean and they're selfish and they're fearful, my heart is broken for them because they obviously have not experienced his love. So rather than taking it personally, I'll take the opportunity to love them and maybe they'll come to know him and experience his love because his love has this transforming healing effect of making broken people whole and angry people joyful and lonely people reconciled and, and fearful people joyful. Amen?
Father God, thank you for an opportunity to come together with your people. Um, Lord, thank you for loving me and my wife and our kids so well. Lord, we have experienced your love in this season in a way that is very rich and very practical and, and very personal. Thank you, Lord, for the people that you brought in our life. Um, pastors, older mentors, counselors, advisors, who have loved us very, very, very well. Um, Lord, I pray for us here at the Trinity Church that, that this would be a church that would mark, be marked by love, um, knowing, Lord, your love for us, your deep, devoted, beloved affection and devotion to we, your children. And Father, we ask that that love that flowed through the cross of Jesus and flowed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit would flow through us so that we could love each other and we could even love this world which, which hates you. But, but that we would love people in hopes that they would come to experience your love and that your love would heal them and that it would change them and transform them and encourage them. And God, I, I just have a sense right now in my heart that there are some here who are hurting, some here who are broken, some who are lonely, some who are confused, some who have been hurt by pastors, and so they're, they're a little concerned about me. They've been hurt by churches, so they're a little concerned about us. And Lord, the answer to everything is the healing love of our Father. So Father, would you, would you just allow us to experience your love, to know of your love, uh, to walk with you, not out of fear of punishment, because Jesus was already punished in our place for our sin and punishment is over with. But to walk in love, to draw near to you because you love us, to be the kind of kids that when you extend your hand, we run to it, not from it, because we know it is to embrace us and not to batter us. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that it is perfect love that casts out fear. And we thank you, Lord God, that that we don't have to live in fear, that we can live in love. And I pray we would grow in that and it would be a liberating, healing, freeing thing, that it would be a joyful and healing experience for us. Holy Spirit, would you please refresh my friends right now? Would you please bring them your love? Would you let them know the love of the Father? Would you let them walk out of here feeling, knowing, sensing, believing that they're loved? Not because of what they've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Not because of who they are, but because of who you are. May that, may that just free them to be healed up and to experience your love and to enjoy your love and to, and to love others and to love you in Jesus' name. Amen.